Hello, my name is Chris Polkerbeck and I work for Regents Hospital Foundation, which is a part of Health Partners System of Care based in Minnesota. And I'm here today with our um, esteemed researcher, Dr. William Fry. He's the Senior Research Director for the Health Partners Center for Memory. And he is going to talk with us today about some promising new approaches to treating and preventing Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, brain injury, and other brain disorders. Welcome, Dr. Fry. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and also, thanks to all of you uh, for listening and watching this presentation. Um, I am going to be telling you uh, about these new approaches to treating and preventing Alzheimer's and other brain disorders, which we have developed uh, and which I'm quite excited about. And we'll get right into it. So for a long time, people have been asking me, why has it taken so long? to develop better ways to treat and prevent Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other brain disorders. And I, I want to say the, the first reason is that the brain is our most important organ. It's obviously a very complex uh, organ. It controls all the other things. It controls our blood pressure, our heart rate. It controls our body temperature. Obviously, it controls thinking, emotions, and so many things. And it's so important that we have evolved a specialized barrier to protect the brain from the substances that enter our body. Uh, we know, for example, that when we eat, drink, breathe things in, or take a pill or get a shot, that a lot of these substances go into our bloodstream. And from the bloodstream, they can go to the liver, the kidneys, the heart, and the lungs. And some of those can also go to the brain. But the blood-brain barrier protects the brain by keeping everything out of the brain that isn't very small, a very small substance or molecule, and that isn't generally soluble in olive oil or some sort of fat. So that's good. Um, that's good that it protects the brain. Uh, but when it comes to treating a brain disorder, it can severely limit the kind of therapeutics and treatments that we can deliver to the brain because we don't want to just deliver small fat soluble substances uh, because they have limited ability to really treat these complex brain disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, head injury, etc. Also, we know that when drugs are taken as a pill or a shot and they go in the bloodstream, even if they're designed to treat headache, depression, or anxiety, or a brain disorder, that those drugs will go, if they're taken into the bloodstream as a pill, they will go actually to all the other organs. And that's why when we see a television commercial about one of these new drugs, they tell you the good things it can do to help your brain but then they go on and on about all the terrible things it might do to your liver and your kidneys, it might even kill you, they usually tell you. The good thing is that the Health Partners Neuroscience Center in St. Paul, we've actually solved this problem of the blood-brain barrier for scientists and doctors around the world who are trying to develop new ways to treat Alzheimer's and other brain disorders. And it was an unusual dream that I had in 1989 that gave us the first clue. In 1989, I went to sleep, and at that time, I was thinking that the natural therapeutic proteins that our body makes would be good to test for treating Alzheimer's disease and other brain disorders. That would include the protein hormone insulin, which you'll be hearing quite a bit more about as we go on. It would also include the protein nerve growth factors that the body makes to signal brain cells to repair worn out parts and to make better connections from one brain cell to the next. And in this dream, I was telling other scientists that these natural therapeutic proteins that I thought this would be the way to treat Alzheimer's. And they were all shaking their head, no, that's not gonna work because of the blood-brain barrier. These proteins are too big, they're too charged. They're not gonna go into the brain if you take them as a pill or a shot. 
And, you know, at that moment, I realized, of course, that was a problem. But we all knew back in 1989 that when harmful substances got into the nose, they could actually go into the brain by following the nerves involved in smell. For example, we knew that when people swam in polluted water and got pathogenic amoebas into their nose, they could die of amoebic infection of the brain. And if, they, if people worked to mine manganese in Chile in a mine and the dust, manganese dust was in the air, and the dust got into their nose, it could go into the brain and cause them to become manic. So we knew harmful things could get into the brain this way. And the idea that came to me in this dream was really very simple. If bad things can do it, why can't good things do it? I woke up, I was really very excited because I realized that we could get around the blood-brain barrier by giving our treatments intranasally. And on the next slide, you see a schematic here of the head with the brain in gray there, uh, and you see the nasal passages in pink. And people, up until I came up with this idea, people had said, oh, well, we'll bore a hole in the skull and we'll inject the drug into the brain, or we'll send it into the cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain. Well, those are not practical. A neurosurgery, that way too expensive, way too risky. You would get, could get brain damage, you could have infections, et cetera. But we focused, if you push Chris one time, we focused on the pathway from the nose to the brain. Simply the idea of spraying the drugs into the brain and allowing them, without going in the bloodstream, to go directly from the nose to the brain along the olfactory nerves and other nerves involved in smell. And as shown on the next slide, this is a non-invasive method, totally non-invasive. It doesn't send these drugs through the blood-brain barrier, it just avoids that barrier, bypassing it completely. It results in very rapid delivery of insulin and other therapeutic proteins and other kinds of drugs to the brain along the nerves involved in smell. Within less than 10 minutes, they are in the brain. And because we have not loaded up the bloodstream with these drugs, we've really reduced the exposure of the other organs to the drug, and therefore, we have much fewer side effects, adverse side effects. Now, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia or dementing illness. Terms like dementia and senility are general terms that really just describe um, a group of symptoms. They're disorders that are characterized by loss of recent memory or re memory of recent event, events, by confusion, by disorientation, people who have any kind of dementing illness may not know where they are, they may not know uh, what year it is or what day it is, they may not be able to remember things that happened recently, even though they might remember things that happened when they were children. Alzheimer's disease, though, is a very particular disease, and it accounts for two-thirds of the cases of dementia in people. The other third are generally due to other dementing illnesses. For example, Lewy body dementia. In Lewy body dementia, people do have a, a lack of, of recent memory, short-term memory. They have memory problems, but they also have certain signs of Parkinsonism. They, uh, they have movement disorder. They might have visual hallucinations. So that's a disease that's really different from Alzheimer's. Uh, not the same disease. Vascular dementia due to small strokes, another disease that can cause memory loss. Frontotemporal dementia and other kinds of diseases. The important thing though is that our research and the research of others has shown that insulin signaling in the brain is greatly decreased in Alzheimer's and in these other disorders. 
Now, insulin is a protein hormone. We think about it in regard to diabetes. People who have diabetes have high levels of blood sugar because their cells are not being signaled by insulin to take up the blood sugar into the cells to provide the body's cells with energy. Similarly, brain cells also need blood sugar or glucose to provide energy to them. And they need also to have insulin signaling. Also, we know that as a result of not getting enough insulin signaling, the brain cell energy decreases. And at the same time, free iron starts to accumulate in the brain, leading to inflammation, which can damage brain cells. Now, we all need iron. We don't want to become anemic. But uh, you don't want free iron in the brain because it produces oxidative damage and inactivates key brain components, uh, as we'll discuss later. Now, the next slide shows that Alzheimer patients' brain don't take up glucose properly. You've heard it said that a picture is worth a thousand words, and that's certainly true with the pictures you're looking at here. If you look at the picture on your right, you're looking at the, at the brain of a normal elderly adult, a living person, who has been given a very small amount of radioactively labeled blood sugar or glucose into their bloodstream. And you see with this imaging, this PET imaging system, all of that blood sugar going into the brain where it's being taken up into the cells and metabolized to provide the brain with the energy that it needs to function. Now you see on the left, the brain of a living person with Alzheimer's disease. And it's very clear that people with Alzheimer's do not take up blood sugar or glucose properly. Now, when this was first seen by scientists, a lot of people said, well, that's not surprising. You know, Alzheimer patients aren't remembering much they're probably not thinking as much as a normal elderly adult. They may not be reasoning and uh, trying to figure things out as much. So maybe their brain cells don't need a lot of energy and they're not taking up much energy. But when we looked at these pictures, we said, wow, people with Alzheimer's are not taking up blood sugar. That means their cells are starved for energy. Of course, that's the reason why they cannot remember, carry out memory processes, processes properly and think normally and reason as well as people who don't have Alzheimer's disease. So in fact, research studies that we and others have done have shown that not only is glucose uptake decreased or blood sugar uptake decreased into the brain, but insulin signaling, the signal that tells brain cells take up glucose, that is greatly reduced. And that has led Suzanne Delamonte at Brown University to call Alzheimer's disease diabetes of the brain. And this leaves brain cells starved for energy and unable to function normally. At Health Partners Neuroscience here in St. Paul, we actually then discovered and patented an intranasal insulin treatment for Alzheimer's disease and for Parkinson's disease. With the idea of simply spraying the insulin into the nose and having it travel directly from the nose into the brain along the nerves involved in smell, to help the brain take up blood sugar and provide the energy needed to function more normally. After this discovery, a total of about six trials in people with Alzheimer's or myocognitive impairment have been carried out in the United States, and five trials have been carried out with the same treatment in normal, healthy human adults in Germany. And these trials have demonstrated improved memory following intranasal insulin treatment. So we have discovered what appears to be a safe, promising treatment for Alzheimer's and potentially for other brain disorders. Now, the National Institutes of Health 
has cited our intranasal insulin treatment as a very promising treatment in development for Alzheimer's, but we know that additional trials are going to be needed to get the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, to approve this treatment for people who have Alzheimer's and other brain disorders. They require many, many clinical trials to make sure that the treatment is safe and effective. So far, this has been a very safe treatment. Uh, the only adverse side effects seen in the clinical trials, more than a dozen trials done so far, is a mild nasal irritation, which is probably not caused by the insulin, but rather by the preservatives that the pharmaceutical industry has added to the insulins that we are using in these trials. Now, we've been conducting clinical trials of intranasal insulin funded by our donors here in St. Paul at the Health Partners Neuroscience Center. And we're currently testing intranasal insulin, not just uh, as we've done in Alzheimer's, but also as a potential treatment for Parkinson's, frontotemporal dementia, and even as a potential treatment for the brain problems that occur in people who have diabetes, especially type 1 diabetes. We know that having type 2 diabetes or adult onset diabetes doubles the risk for getting Alzheimer's. That's not surprising because people with diabetes don't have enough insulin signaling to begin with. And we feel that human clinical trials are needed to determine if intranasal insulin might be able to reduce the risk of people who have diabetes, the risk of getting Alzheimer's in these 30 million people in the United States who have diabetes. But those are longitudinal studies, long-term studies, and they would be expensive. And so far, we've not had the funding to carry out those trials to see if intranasal insulin can help prevent people with diabetes from getting Alzheimer's. We do know from a clinical trial that has been done uh, by others uh, that intranasal insulin does improve memory in people who have type 2 diabetes who don't have Alzheimer's disease. And we believe that it can benefit people with type 1 diabetes or juvenile diabetes by helping the brain respond better to situations in which people with type 1 diabetes develop what's called hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. This is really important because if you have hypoglycemia and you don't realize that it's happening, suddenly with type 1 diabetics, you might actually just pass out. And if no one is there or finds you within a reasonable period of time, you may actually die from that. So that's a very important uh, thing for us to be trying to treat. Now, I mentioned that we originally patented the intranasal insulin for treating Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. We did uh, Alzheimer trials, but we never had the funding to do Parkinson's trials until very recently. However, last year, we were very pleased to see that Harvard and the University of Massachusetts carried out a clinical trial of our intranasal insulin treatment in patients who had Parkinson's and found that, in fact, their memory was improved, their verbal fluency uh, was improved, and that they had less physical disability and improved movement when compared to their baseline scores before they got the treatment. So this is very encouraging. And we're sure that other trials will be done uh, in Parkinson's patients. We also think that intranasal insulin might be able to treat other brain disorders. For example, we know that when people have <coughs> chronic unalleviated stress or post-traumatic stress disorder, and that could include our veterans or other people, uh, we know that the stress hormone goes up. That is the hormone cortisol. And that stress hormone can prevent the brain from taking up blood sugar or glucose normally. It's already been shown in Germany that our intranasal insulin uh, treatment can actually reduce that stress hormone in adult men exposed to stress. 
And we know that intranasal insulin obviously can improve memory in normal adults and in people with other memory disorders. So we believe that this same treatment may help our veterans who have PTSD. And we did receive funding from the largest psychiatry foundation in the country, the Brain and Behavior Foundation, to carry out a trial of this treatment uh, at Yale University with a, a psychiatrist who's a, our collaborator there. So we're hoping that that trial will take place this year. In addition, working with the US Military Medical School and our collaborator there, Kimberly, Dr. Kimberly Byrnes, we have shown that intranasal insulin can actually treat traumatic brain injury, head injury, and concussion in animals. And because intranasal insulin has been found to be safe in humans, we are now seeking funding to test intranasal insulin in humans who have had a head injury or concussions. Obviously, this would be very helpful, not just to the military and veterans who've had head injury, but to people involved in sports like football players, hockey players, boxers, et cetera. We're also looking into using this treatment for treating multiple sclerosis. Uh, and there are uh, very good reasons why we want to do that. And we're also thinking about it as a potential treatment for seizures and epilepsy. Uh, and we've been talking with an epileptologist at Cleveland Clinic about potentially carrying out a trial there. Finally, we just published a paper uh, about the potential use of intranasal insulin to treat alcohol use disorder, binge drinking, and other kinds of addictions. And we plan to carry out a clinical trial uh, with our collaborator at Brown University, who is an expert in uh, addiction and alcohol use disorder. Now, another intranasal treatment that we've developed for Alzheimer's is based on the fact that I mentioned to you earlier that free iron can accumulate abnormally in the brain in people who have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, or head injury. And we know that free iron is damaging and it inactivates in particular the brain's receptors for memory and certain other key receptors involved in movement. Uh, the next slide. So we're lucky that there is a drug that's been around for about 40 years that binds iron. This drug is called deferoxamine. And this drug binds iron very, very tightly. And it's been used to reduce iron overload in the blood of humans for many years. There even was a clinical trial where this iron binding drug was injected into the muscles of people with Alzheimer's once a day and was shown to reduce their decline by 50%. But unfortunately, it had a number of adverse side effects and it doesn't really cross the blood brain barrier very well. So we have developed and patented an intranasal iron binding drug treatment uh, that has been found to treat Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, stroke, traumatic brain injury uh, in mice and rats. And so now human clinical trials are what we are aiming for next. And we are dealing uh, in communication with the Food and Drug Administration, uh, who has asked us to provide them a little more safety data, but we hope by the end of this year, we'll be allowed to begin human clinical trials with this treatment. We do know that in animals, intranasal deferoxamine can actually uh, reduce memory loss in mouse models of Alzheimer's and improve memory in normal mice. We know that it treats uh, uh, animal models of Parkinson's, whether that's the inherited kind of Parkinson's or Parkinson's due to exposure to a toxin that damages the dopamine brain cells. We know that just a few nose drops of this iron binding drug given before or after a stroke can reduce the brain damage caused by the stroke by more than 55%. And so all of this is uh, encouraging us to move into human clinical trials. Now, the third treatment we've developed that uses intranasal delivery 
is the intranasal use of adult stem cells to treat Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and other brain disorders. All of us as adults have stem cells in our bone marrow. And those stem cells are smart cells. They're like little doctors and they can help repair damage. And we found that these adult stem cells obtained from bone marrow, when given intranasally, can bypass the blood-brain barrier and target the areas of the brain that are damaged to treat brain disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. You may remember me telling you that in the dream I had, it occurred to me that harmful cells like amoebas, if they get in your nose from polluted water, can damage the brain. And here we're using therapeutic cells, adult stem cells from bone marrow. And these adult stem cells are very anti-inflammatory. And Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and these other disorders we're talking about are inflammatory brain disorders. So when given intranasally, these stem cells can go into the brain and eliminate that inflammation to treat these disorders. They, as, as they go into the brain, they don't go everywhere. They only go to the areas of the brain in, that have damage and they see what's missing. And in addition to getting rid of the inflammation, they provide the brain with what is missing. This table shows you some of the animal studies that have been done and shown efficacy of intranasal bone marrow derived stem cells. Working with Dr. Lucina Daniellen, our collaborator in Germany, who's carried out all of our stem cell studies at the University Hospital of Tübingen. She's shown that intranasal insulin treats Parkinson's disease and not only eliminates the inflammation, but provides the brain, brains of the animals that have Parkinson's with dopamine. And also she's shown that it can treat Alzheimer's in animals, improving their memory, getting rid of amyloid, and other researchers in the Netherlands, like Cindy von Beethoven, has shown she can treat neonatal brain damage and models of cerebral palsy. Uh, researchers at Emory, like Dr. Wei, have shown they can treat stroke with intranasal cell therapy. Uh, Dr. Franson in Sweden have shown that she could treat MS with intranasal stem cells and T cells. Uh, people at University of Chicago showed they could treat brain tumors uh, with our help um, with intranasal cell therapy. And people are even looking at this for treating spinal cord injury. So our discoveries are really revolutionary. And they represent a real dramatic departure from the research of other universities and drug companies. Most of the other groups working on treating Alzheimer's have tried to treat Alzheimer's by getting rid of this protein called beta amyloid, which accumulates in the brains of people with Alzheimer's. And this strategy, unfortunately, has resulted in decades of failed human clinical trials. The most recent loss was the $18 billion loss by the company Biogen in Boston who developed a treatment to get rid of amyloid as in an attempt to treat Alzheimer's. But other companies like Pfizer, Roche, Lilly, J&J, &J, Merck have also developed drugs to get rid of amyloid. And while some of those treatments did get rid of amyloid or reduce it, none of them improved memory or were helpful to people with Alzheimer's. So our approach has really been very different. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit now, less about treatment and more about how do we reduce our risk for getting Alzheimer's and what can we really do to protect the brain. The first thing, of course, is to prevent head injury. It's really important when you're driving to wear your seatbelt. You shouldn't be doing sports where you might get a head injury without wearing a helmet. And that would include things like biking and rollerblading or ice skating or any number of things where you may uh, uh, have a head injury. Also, it's very important to get exercise. Exercise like uh, swimming, uh, walking, 
jogging, uh, working in the garden, doing yoga, which is what I like to do, or some other kind of exercise where you increase your heart rate and your breathing. And it's best to do this at least 45 minutes when you exercise, and as the, optimally to do it three times a week. Also, diet is really important. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you about the MIND diet, which is an improvement on the Mediterranean diet. We'll talk about that. But there are also other things, like we know, for example, that people in India have about one-fourth the amount of Alzheimer's that people in the United States do. And that is due, we believe, in large part to the fact that they use the spice turmeric to make yellow curry. Uh, as you know, Indian is a, India is a very hot country, and for centuries there was no refrigeration, or long before the discovery of electricity or invention of electricity. And how could they preserve their fruits and vegetables? How could they preserve their fish, etc.? They found that the spice turmeric actually helped to prevent the cells of those vegetables and those foods from degrading by using turmeric, which has a chemical in it called curcumin. Uh, and that actually helps us when we take turmeric to preserve the health of our cells. Green tea has also another uh, substance. It's a strong antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, um, uh, used, of course, primarily in Asia. It's also important to stay mentally and socially active. And all of you here listening to me speak are doing that right now. Finally, you need to have your blood checked about once every two years at a minimum to make sure you're not becoming deficient in vitamin D or vitamin B12, and to make sure that you're not, your thyroid gland is producing enough thyroid hormone. If you are deficient in B12 or thyroid hormone, your memory will become bad. And this, these are treatable problems. With thyroid hormone, your doctor can prescribe Synthroid or some other medication. For B12 deficiency, your doctor can prescribe a series of B12 shots. Also, we know that people who are deficient in vitamin D are at much higher risk of getting Alzheimer's. So you don't want that to happen. Now, sometimes when people hear me say these things, they say, oh, well, I don't really need to go see the doctor and do a blood test. I'll just go to the drugstore and start taking vitamin D and vitamin B12. The problem is that if you're really deficient in vitamin D, you're not going to fix that deficiency by taking 1,000 units of vitamin D a day. You're going to need a doctor to prescribe a certain kind of vitamin D therapy to fix that deficiency. Similarly with B12, just putting a little B12 pill under your tongue is not going to do the trick you're likely to need a series of B12 shots. So these are things to do to protect your brain and reduce your risk for Alzheimer's. Now, plants are not only the major source of our food and calories, they're also required for health uh, because they, are this, they have in them things that can be medicinal and they are the source of many of our medicines. About 40% of the drugs used in the United States today originally came from plants. We know, for example, that aspirin originally was derived from willow bark and other plant sources uh, before uh, the company Bayer uh, altered it slightly and turned it into the aspirin that we use today. We know that uh, digitalis, or the heart, came from the foxglove plant. And there are uh, recipine and other drugs uh, that came for plants for headache and different things like that. So foods derived from plants have pharmacologic effects on our brain. There is a particular diet called the MIND diet that has been found to be associated with a reduced incidence of Alzheimer's disease. And researchers at Rush University and Harvard School of Public Health have studied over 900, or they've studied 923 people aged between about 58 and 98 
who they followed for four and a half years. And what they found is, on the next slide, that the greater your adherence to the MIND diet, the lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease. This was a prospective study, and it estimates the effect of a 53% reduction in the rate of getting Alzheimer's for people who are in the who most closely follow the MIND diet compared to people who don't follow the MIND diet at all, and even a 35% reduction in the rate of getting, it, getting Alzheimer's in those who even modestly follow this diet. So what is this diet? Well, there are 10 food groups that the MIND diet wants you to eat more of. First and foremost are green leafy vegetables, things like spinach, kale, chard, collard greens, and salad greens. So you need to eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, at least one serving a day, I would say. Other vegetables, they also want you to eat once a day, some other vegetable. And it turns out that nuts are very important. And so if you're not allergic to nuts, Eating walnuts, pistachios, sunflower nuts, and other nuts are actually very good for you. Blueberries and strawberries are another key item on the MIND diet. Not fruit in general, but blueberries and strawberries in particular. Beans, whole grains, and fish, especially salmon, tuna, herring, sardines, and black cod. Poultry, at least twice a week, that would be chicken or turkey. And the MIND diet wants you to use olive oil as your main cooking oil, not butter or lard or other kinds of fats. It also recommends a glass of wine a day. The MIND diet would like you to eat less red meat. It doesn't say you can't have a steak three times a week but it doesn't want you to just eat meat and potatoes every day of the week or hamburgers every day of the week. The Mind Diet would like to see you eat less butter and margarine. You can butter your toast or put a little butter on your baked potato, but they don't want you eating a lot of butter and margarine, and they would like to see you eat less cheese. Pastries and sweets, they ask that you have less than five servings a week, and they really don't want you to eat fried and, and fast foods. So studies suggest that the MIND diet reduces the risk of developing Alzheimer's. And as I mentioned, in addition, turmeric and green tea are also likely helpful. In fact, every morning I actually drink a, a turmeric and ginger tea uh, sold by Rishi, but I'm sure there are other companies that sell uh, turmeric teas. So we need to consider not only big pharma, but also the little farmer. We have to wait on the pharmaceutical industry to come up with what we need to treat these diseases. But no one can stop us from going to the farmer's market and getting the kinds of foods that are going to make us healthy. Diet and exercise and remaining socially and mentally active, these are also very important for reducing our risk. And as I've told you, our discoveries of intranasal insulin, the iron binding drug deferoxamine, and adult stem cells are moving us toward FDA approval to help treat and prevent these brain disorders. Here's a picture of a dinner that I uh, cooked, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the MIND diet, you see the greens, you see the salmon and the mixed grains and a glass of wine. And um, I think one more slide. Uh, the key take home messages here are the therapeutics we've discovered and our new way of delivering therapeutics to the brain. This intranasal method is being used by research laboratories and uh, medical researchers all around the world from almost every country now. Uh, obviously, the intranasal insulin treatment for improving memory uh, and the other treatments that we need to get more funding to uh, carry out the trials that are needed to get the FDA approval. And there's one more slide. 
So thank you so much for taking the time to listen, and I hope uh, this has helped to uh, inform you more about what we and others are doing uh, to develop new ways to treat and prevent Alzheimer's and other brain disorders. So uh, Chris, maybe you can stop uh, sharing the screen and we can have a, a little bit of a discussion. I had the pleasure of talking to you the other day and um, we were talking about COVID-19 and I think that is on everybody's mind. So I would just love your, your thoughts on, on that in general. Okay. So right now across the globe, people are becoming infected with this COVID-19 virus. And we know that this infection leads to accumulation of the virus in the nose. And the, the virus can travel from the nose to the lungs where it can cause severe inflammation in people with serious cases, uh, leading to a disease called acute respiratory distress syndrome that this virus can cause. And of course, that can lead to death even in some people. The fact is that viruses have been known to transport directly from the nose to the brain along these same nerve pathways that I've previously been telling you about that are involved in smell. And this has been known since the early 1900s. Further, some people with the COVID-19 infection have reported losing their sense of smell early in the course of this infection. So this raises the risk that COVID-19 is actually going into the olfactory system and likely reaching the brain. And this could increase the risk for inflammatory disorders in the brain, things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And this kind of scenario of developing serious adverse side effects long after a flu pandemic uh, is not unknown because in 1918, the flu pandemic, which killed so many people, for people who survived that, who got the, the flu but didn't die from it, many of them went on later in life to develop Parkinson's or a Parkinsonian syndrome uh, as a result of that virus potentially uh, causing damage or being reactivated uh, later in life. So we need to be looking now into what is happening with this virus in regard to the brain. People, when people die from this, we should be examining the brain and determining is the virus in their brain or not? And has it reached areas involved that might be involved in Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, et cetera, or to the breathing centers of the brain? Now, the good news is that the anti-inflammatory treatments, such as intranasal insulin and the bone marrow stem cells, have been shown to go into the brain and treat these inflammatory disorders. And these treatments reach the brain by following the same nerve pathways. So intranasal anti-inflammatory stem cells are like fire trucks chasing the inflammatory arsonists up the same highway into the brain. Now, the discovery of the intranasal insulin treatment, which I told you about, took place at Regents Hospital and is being developed at Health Partners Neuroscience Center uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. But the intranasal stem cell treatment uh, studies have been carried out by our very excellent collaborator, Dr. Lucina Daniellen in Germany. And uh, so we are really investigating all of these. And we hope that not just for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but potentially for the adverse effects of this flu pandemic uh, that we may find out about later, that these treatments may be very, very helpful. So um, that's excellent. So going back to 1918, after, after the Spanish flu, yes. you, you, you're able to see the rates of, of Parkinson's increase decades later. Was yes. it a longer period of time? Was it 20, 30 years? Or how um, did that well, out? It, Of course, it would have depended in part on how old the people were when they got the virus. And I should point out that while the 1918 flu was call, called the Spanish flu by people in the United States. It didn't start in Spain, it started in the United States. 
And Woodrow Wilson was president then. And uh, unfortunately, he sent our soldiers who were infected with this flu to Europe uh, to fight in World War I. And, and that was a serious mistake that uh, led to the spread of this flu uh, across Europe. Yeah. So um, even though Dr. Alzheimer did his work in, in 19, 1900 to 1906 and in that yeah. time frame and later, really people weren't using the term Alzheimer's on a widespread basis until the, really the 80s. Right. Um, so, I would say it was probably the 70s when they... Yeah, I mean, people, here's the thing, you know, in 1900, the average lifespan was 50. So there weren't a lot of people who were living into the age of risk of Alzheimer's. And the first patient he saw was a 51-year-old woman. She wasn't very old. And so researchers and doctors thought this was a rare disease. And, you know, uh, uh, but when people, when we solved the problem in the 20s, uh, for diabetics when insulin was invented and started to be sold by Eli Lilly in the 1920s. And people started living longer because we had sulfa drugs, we had antibiotics. Now all of a sudden, by the 70s, a lot of people are living into the age of risk and are getting Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, so um, Alzheimer's also probably went by another name like hardening of the arteries or senility. Yes. Did, it, was there a correlation of cases of more people described as having senility after the eighteen, uh, the nineteen eighteen epidemic? Not that I am aware of. Uh, yes, people were calling it before they started using the word Alzheimer's. They were calling it organic brain syndrome or senility or hardening of the arteries of the brain. But I don't think that uh, it was thought to be um, a, a increase the risk for. Alzheimer's was thought to be increased by that disorder. I think it was really this particular uh, Parkinsonism kind of syndrome. So, so going back to, to COVID and focusing right now on the current day, what, what are your thoughts about how this virus might be affecting the brain that people are just starting to think about? Well, I don't see much in the literature about COVID and the brain. Uh, what people are mainly, if they're thinking about that at all, they're thinking about two things. One, the loss of smell, which is controlled by the nerves in the nose where the virus is, as well as the olfactory bulb that is in it that those nerves are attached to. Or they may be thinking about breathing because people are dying from uh, respiratory distress. Even when they appear to be able to breathe, of course, if your lungs fill with fluids, you can make breathing moves, but you're not necessarily getting oxygen. Uh, but, um, so, but my concern is that we've known for a long time that viruses travel these nerve pathways, not just the olfactory pathway involved in smell, but the trigeminal nerve pathway from the nose to the brain. The trigeminal nerves are involved in what's called the general chemical sense and for detecting uh, organic solvents and other kinds of uh, chemicals. So um, uh, my concern is once in the brain, if, these, if the COVID virus reaches the brain, what would be the consequences long-term? Realize also that other viruses, for example, people who get chickenpox when they're young, may much later in life, with reactivation of that, develop, um, develop shingles. So the notion of a virus causing something at one time in life, and then unfortunately coming back later and causing another kind of problem. And shingles, of course, is a nerve problem. You know, so uh, I don't think what I'm suggesting as a possibility, and only as a possibility, is a, a far-fetched idea. So with, a, with, a, um, with an autopsy, looking at the brain, what yes. areas of the brain would you like them to be investigating to, to well, give you more data? Well, we may actually do, that. we may do some of these studies ourselves. We're, we want to look, obviously, we would want to look at 
areas that might be involved in the brainstem in respiration, we would certainly want to look at the substantia nigra where the dopamine brain cells are in the midbrain, where that's where Parkinson's changes would be likely seen or in the striatum. And certainly with regard to dementing illnesses, we would be very interested in seeing if the virus is going into uh, the hippocampus and the limbic system, which controls memory or the cortex, uh, you know, and other kinds of uh, areas that are involved in those disorders. The, we would be looking at all of that. This is um, fantastic and really fascinating. So how about with the loss of smell? Can you help explain that? Why, why, sure. why do we think that's happening? Well, first of all, you need to know that it is fairly common for anyone who develops a degenerative brain disorder, whether it's ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, a lot of people lose their sense of smell early in the course of those, dis those disorders. And in fact, smell and memory are pretty tightly connected. So we all know that from having had the experience that sometimes you will smell something and it will trigger a memory, a specific memory connected with that smell. It turns out that the nerves involved in smell, the olfactory nerves that go through the roof of the nasal cavity through little holes or foramen up into the brain, into the olfactory bulb, that those, that first olfactory region of the brain is directly connected to all of the other regions that are damaged in Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, in 1989, a famous uh, 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 doctor, uh, Eugene Roberts, uh, and as well as um, uh, a fellow named Raymond Bardis, uh, wrote articles about this connection of the uh, uh, olfactory and smell with memory. And so uh, these, these are important, you know, connections. We also know from animal studies, and I forget the woman researcher's name who did these animal studies. I think she was from Russia originally. She showed that if you damage the olfactory bulb in an animal that is normal, the animal will go on to develop Alzheimer brain changes, even though that species of animal normally never gets Alzheimer's disease. So damaging the area involved in smell, which this virus might do, has the potential, theoretically, to cause other kinds of brain changes that could lead to degenerative brain disorders. So that's sort of what you, what you would be believing for those patients who report a loss of smell due to COVID, you would be expecting that this would be the result of that sort of damage. Well, I would think that this would be a possibility. And I would think that the risk would be higher in people who had more severe disease. So people who just get a very mild, you know, case of the disease, you know, there are people that are asymptomatic. Um, I'm not sure that it would be likely in someone who's asymptomatic that they would have a high enough viral load in the nose to threaten the health of the brain over the lifetime of that individual. But a person who had a very serious case of the disease, but obviously didn't die from it, uh, who went on to live for many years, might in fact be at risk. This we don't know this. This is why the research needs to be done. Uh, what's not happening right now that you would like to see happening in terms of a, a national response to, to COVID? COVID? Yeah. Obviously, we you know, need the protective equipment for our doctors and uh, you know, our nurses and those on the front line, uh, the police, the fire department, et cetera. Obviously, we don't have enough ventilators. But when it comes to treatment, people do need to think about stem cells because they are so anti-inflammatory. And it turns out that if you take stem cells intravenously, where do they end up primarily? In the lungs. That could be very helpful 
for this disease. Not a good thing if you're trying to treat Alzheimer's or a brain disease. That's why we're giving our stem cells intranasally. But if you have a disease that can kill people by damaging the lungs, which this disease does, you definitely could give the stem cells intravenously. And if they're anti-inflammatory, as most stem cells are, I would expect that you would hopefully see some benefit. Now, the only way to know that is to carry out uh, controlled clinical trials, but there's plenty of opportunity to do that, unfortunately, in our, in our current situation. I'm, I, I wrote down, and it's too messy to show, but I, I have plaques and tangles, Yes. Typical Alzheimer's pathology. Um, and then over here, um, free iron. Over here, free iron. And then over here, the idea of, um, of insulin. And then in the middle, inflammation. So let me tell you how they're all connected. Great. That was what okay. I was going for. <laughs> okay. First of all, amyloid, you talked about plaques. Amyloid is not very toxic if it doesn't have iron or heme, the heme porphyrin ring with iron in the middle, if it doesn't have heme or iron bound to it, it is not very toxic. And we have published papers showing that the, the animal species that naturally develop Alzheimer's, like humans and polar bears, have amyloids that bind iron-containing heme. The animals that don't get Alzheimer's don't have the binding site for that. That's one thing. So iron is more important, in my view, than amyloid by far. We also know that because these drugs that all these companies spent billions on reduce amyloid and don't help people at all who have Alzheimer's. <laughs> Second thing we know is that when insulin goes into the brain, the brain gets the signal, take up blood sugar, it takes up blood sugar. And that provides energy to brain cells. You can think and replace, you have the energy to replace parts that wear out, so the brain doesn't degenerate. Once the brain has gotten the insulin signal, it produces in response to insulin, an enzyme to get rid of that insulin. And it's called insulin degrading enzyme, IDE. Why does the brain want to get rid of the insulin after it gets the signal? Because it knows that sometime in the future, another insulin signal will be sent into the brain. And it's much easier to detect it if there isn't a boatload of insulin already there. So what does it turn out that the main way the brain gets rid of amyloid is? You have to have an amyloid as a protein. The main enzyme that degrades amyloid is insulin degrading enzyme. So if you don't have insulin signaling, if insulin doesn't come into the brain and produce insulin degrading enzyme, what happens? You accumulate amyloid. Does that mean amyloid causes Alzheimer's? No. Insulin deficiency causes memory loss and lack of brain cell energy and decreased function but it doesn't tell you that amyloid caused it. So without iron and without insulin signaling, amyloid suddenly becomes an issue. Also, insulin inhibits the enzyme that phosphorylates the microtubule associated protein tau to form the Alzheimer tangles. So if you don't have insulin signaling, you will have more activity of glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, that enzyme that phosphorylates tau and forms the Alzheimer tangles. So Is there, oh, things sorry. are related. These things are definitely related. So it, what's the relationship between the free um, iron and, and the insulin sig signaling? Okay, there is a very important relationship there. Iron, first of all, First of all, iron is damaging because it catalyzes what's called Fenton chemistry. It produces free radicals that cause oxidative damage, wipe out your muscarinic cholinergic receptor required for memory and many other key brain components. Iron, when it's attached to hemoglobin, is fine, or other 
therapeutic proteins that it that where it's working normally is fine. It's just the free iron that's damaging. Now, the deferoxamine that binds iron, it by this drug that we're giving intranasally, it binds iron at 10 to the 31st power, very, very high affinity. And it has been shown to treat Alzheimer's stroke, Parkinson's, et cetera, head injury in animals. This drug, when it binds iron, it also produces nerve growth factors that protect the brain from damage. The one in particular that it makes is called hypoxia ischemic factor one alpha, HIF one alpha. But deferoxamine treatment also increases the production of insulin receptors. So if, if you give insulin, we know that, first of all, we know that in Alzheimer's, there's what they call insulin resistance. That means the brain is not responding to insulin the way it should. Now, that could be because you don't have enough insulin coming in, which is what we're trying to fix by giving intranasal insulin, or that the receptor is not, there's not enough of it, or who knows what. So when you have a drug that can get rid of the iron and jack up the insulin receptors, express new receptors, and you've got the insulin, you can combine these treatments to get a much more synergistic and robust effect. And that's where we're headed. That's, it's, this is really fascinating. So uh, what's that normal process of the, the free iron accumulation in the brain? How does, uh, how, why is that accumulating? Is it accumulating abnormally in the brain? It how does. is it crossing? So the blood brain it, barrier it, it, it accumulates abnormally in the brain and it accumulates to some degree just to some degree with normal aging but it accumulates dramatically in much much higher amounts in parkinson's alzheimer's uh head injury obviously in hemorrhage you have actually blood going into the brain which has iron in it and you know but uh whether why the iron accumulates, uh, no one's really said why. But my theory, and this is totally theory, is that if your brain cells are starved for energy because you're not getting insulin signaling, you don't have the energy to do the normal removal of iron, free iron from brain cells. So you have problem. You have pumps. You have ion pumps in your cells. Some put, some pump, uh, you know, sodium out and potassium in. Some do, and and they require ATP or energy, cellular energy. By the way, it's been shown in normal, healthy adult humans that if you spray insulin in their nose, in a living human, you can see ATP go up in the brain by using phosphorus thirty one MRI imaging. So we know this increases brain cell energy. And if you don't have the energy, then you don't pump out the iron and it accumulates. That's a theory, but we haven't done the studies. You know, we have very little money, honestly. <laughs> Seriously, very little money. I showed you though that one slide, Biogen lost 18 billion on their drug. Every one of those companies lost at least 20 billion, I'd say. Our budget, for each year is 1.5 million. Imagine, you know, imagine. We barely can cover the payroll. I mean. <laughs> so, so this is, that's what I'm telling you. So it's, yeah. there are a lot of things we like to do if we could, but it doesn't mean we can just do them because we can't afford them. But if I if I hear you right, um, it, it's sort of uh, because of the decreased amount of, of cellular energy, decreased amount right. of ATP, that right. it's almost as if this is a, a priority effect in the brain. It's do the cells are doing all this other stuff, and that that clearing of the iron gets lower right. on the the energy That's priority what, list. Yeah, yeah. it's Thank kind you. of a a vicious cycle, probably in my view. Uh, if you don't get rid of the iron you lose your memory receptor and you probably are not producing insulin receptors the way you want. And so that means insulin becomes less effective. But when you remove the iron with the deferoxamine, you're getting rid of the damaging iron and you're increasing the effectiveness of insulin.
Similarly, when you give the insulin, you may be reducing the iron uh, that's occurring and therefore improving things that way. But we'd like to use them both together. That's, the, that's what, what we really want. Yeah. Absolutely. So if, if you have a big donor watching and said, uh, what, what if I gave you $20 million to focus on COVID, yeah. how, how would you prioritize your well, research to okay, attack so what that? I would do, there, there are a number of things that I would do. Um, first, we would want some preclinical studies to go on. Uh, by preclinical, what I really mean is not involving a clinical trial in humans. So we would definitely want to have an autopsy on some patients who have died with this, and we would want to um, assess what's happened in the brain. Where did the virus go? Okay. Another thing we would want to do is we would want to um, do some imaging on people who have the infection where we can look at the brain and ask the question, have these, are these patients accumulating iron in the brain? Are they taking up glucose normally in the brain just by imaging these people? You know, we're not hurting them. We're just imaging and asking questions. Um, we would also obviously want to link up or partner with a company that has anti-inflammatory stem cells that could be used in humans and we'd want to give those stem cells intravenously and you know versus versus people not getting that treatment to see does that help them to recover from the breathing and lung problems or not reduce the risk of death uh, reduce uh, the need for ventilators etc we would want to try those same stem cells intranasally we'd want to try both in some patients, you know, there's so many things. In, you now we're just talking about COVID now, you know, right. and then of course, and that, and those are more focused on the fact that we have the pandemic going on right now. But once the pandemic is over, people are going to want to forget about this. And I'm telling you, we better not do that because of what could happen years later. So if I had the a billion dollars, I'd be working towards that. And of course, if we had the money we would be carrying out the intranasal insulin trials in PTSD, in head injury, in epilepsy, in MS. You know, let me just tell you one thing about MS, because it's, it's something that we figured out no one else did. The big problem in multiple sclerosis is that you don't, you lose your myelin nerve covering. And the cells that are responsible for remyelination and keeping the myelin cover on your nerve cells in the brain are called oligodendrocytes. And the entire literature is filled with papers saying these cells have a disease. They call it oligo oligodendropathy. Okay, what's the disease? They don't have enough ATP. They don't have enough energy to remyelinate. That's why they're not doing it. Now, What's the other thing we know that no one else cares about, but what we care about? These cells are covered with insulin receptors. Now, why not try intranasal insulin in MS? Now, first of all, that's not a far out idea. Our intranasal insulin is being tested right now in people with MS by Johns Hopkins. But why are they doing it? They're doing it because 30% of MS patients have memory loss. They're not thinking about the fact that it might actually be a treatment for MS. Do you see what I'm saying? So if we I had sure, money, sure do. money, there's a million things we'd be doing. Yeah. So, um, so maybe this is a point where Chris can come in on your behalf. Um, so I've heard, I've heard all this promising uh, and hopeful news from Dr. Fry, and, and I'm a donor and I want to help support this research. Chris, how do I go about doing that? Well, let me share my screen again. Um, we're happy to talk with anybody who would um, be interested in what would be the best way um, that would work the best for you and the most efficient. But there's some contact information up on your screen. And also you can um, give me a phone call directly. Um, my phone number um, in my office is 651-254-3300. Six five one. 
254-3736. And I'll also share my um, email with you, Clark, um, that we can put up on the screen so people can email me as well. And then we can talk with them about the variety of ways that they can support Dr. Fry and his team of um, staff who are, are working so diligently to find better treatments and, you know, hopefully potentially cures for these neurological conditions. So. Fantastic. So thank you for that. Welcome so, to the donations. Yep. Yeah. So, so Doc, I know we've kept you way over time. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for the work you're doing and these creative ideas.